Hi everyone, my name is uh, Mandeep Singh and I'm a uh, professor and uh, director of the acute coronary syndrome uh, at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to invite, but he doesn't need an introduction anymore. He's been uh, a lighting force for, for our, our acute coronary syndrome webinars. And today, Dr. Gersh uh, is going to speak on long-term cardiovascular complications of COVID-19. Um, this topic has uh, made headlines since the onset of the pandemic, but little is known on what happens after the acute events have passed. We know uh, from, from the literature that uh, people who present with acute coronary syndrome present less, uh, present late. Uh, we also know that most people are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, and then there's a gradation of severity from mild to moderately severe, which needs hospital stay to an ICU-like care. But we don't know what happens to these individuals after they are discharged or when they have this COVID, and then what happens to them afterwards. Dr. Gersh has highlighted in his recent paper and has done a lot of research, not only on the acute events, but also what happens long-term what are the complications? What are the cardiovascular complications we need to look at at these patients? What kind of additional research we need to do uh, in order to better understand um, and then focus on where our research strategies should be on these patients long term? Um, Dr. Gersh, it is my distinct pleasure to invite you again uh, in this forum and uh, would like to uh, 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 I mean, it's it, it's it's a it's a it's an honor. It's not a pleasure. It's an honor to to have teachers like you, who then illuminate all of us on the on the themes that nobody thinks about. You know, and and this is one of them that long term complications. Nobody thinks about what happens after the acute event is over. So, Dr. Gersh, uh, help us understand what are the long term complications of COVID nineteen. Thank you, thank you, Mandeep. And as always, it's a uh... Pleasure to be here. Long-term cardiovascular um, complications of COVID. Now, the pathophysiology and manifestations of what are called cardiac injury in COVID-19 is a bidirectional interaction, and I'll explain that as I get towards the end of the slide. The pathophysiology is really very complex. Severe sepsis, hypoxemia, cytokine storm, the bradykinin hypothesis, autoantibodies, coagulopathy, endothelial and microvascular inflammation dysfunction. All of these pathophysiologic entities probably take place to a greater or lesser extent in our patients with COVID-19 who have cardiac injury. Cardiac injury, other manifestations of it, uh, type 1 myocardial infarction due to sympathetic nervous system activation. Inflammation in itself can cause plaque rupture. Hypoxemia, hypoxemia and increased myocardial oxygen demands due to tachycardia and sepsis can lead to a type 2 MI. Takotsubo has been uh, clearly reported in increased numbers um, during the pandemic, not surprising given the stress of the pandemic. Myocarditis is the usual suspect, but it's actually an infrequent culprit, and I'm going to come back to this because there was a huge amount of publicity about myocarditis early on and late. Thrombosis arterial and venous probably plays a critical role in the cardiovascular manifestations of uh, COVID. It tends to be more platelet dependent. It may be viral mediated platelet inflammation. There is also evidence for hypercoagulability of red cells, but the end result is an increased rate of thrombosis, arterial and venous. In terms of the clinical outcomes, the commonest manifestation of cardiac injury is just a troponin rise, chest pain, MI, 
heart failure, shock, RV dysfunction, arrhythmias, pulmonary embolism, frequently reported stroke and microvascular dysfunction and pericardial involvement. Now, why I say it's a bi-directional interaction are these modifying factors because uh, what has been associated with the epidemic has been a delayed presentation to the emergency department, delayed diagnosis, late treatment, which in fact can contribute to exacerbating cardiac injury, pre-existing uh, comorbidities, fever, drugs, uh, including antiviral drugs, some of which may have some cardiotoxicity, electrolyte abnormalities, and simply logistical constraints in health systems that are overwhelmed by the magnitude of the pandemic. So this is from a recent review by Dr. Satterfield, one of our fellows at Mayo, myself and Dr. Deepak Butt from the Brigham. Uh, the acute CV complications, arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, pericarditis left and right ventricular systolic dysfunction, stroke and deep vein thrombosis. And the question is, what is their long-term impact? We know a fair amount about what happens acutely, but what is the long-term impact? Now, myocarditis does occur. And this is one report um, from New Jersey, uh, two cases, no prior CV history, shock presentation a week after COVID diagnosis, treatment with steroids and inotropes, LV function on echo, look at the pro BNP 53, 2005 PG per ml. And then four days after admission, a significant improvement in ejection fraction. And case number two, uh, the same kind of presentation, 45 to 55% after discharge. And uh, this is very consistent with acute myocarditis. What is interesting is this entity of delayed onset myocarditis uh, following COVID-19. This is a study from the UK, nine patients, um, uh, black African ancestry and seven, mean age 36 years. And uh, they all had uh, acute cardiac decompensation with the clinical features of uh, recent COVID infection. Follow-up, at least in um, follow-up, complete recovery was noted in four patients. But this is what is interesting. Acutely, they had multiple negative sars cov uh, COVID to rapid um, real-time PCR testing. But subsequently, the cars COVID-2 antibody levels were extremely high in all patients. So this is an example of delayed onset myocarditis. One of the early uh, histological autopsy studies on 21 patients who died of uh, COVID using um, morphology and microscopy and looking at the composition of the inflammatory cells. Uh, what they saw in terms of cardiac pathological changes was RV strain in 19%, focal pericarditis, 19%, endocardial uh, thrombosis in 14%, diffuse macrophage infiltration in the majority, small vessel thrombi, which I believe are an important pathophysiological feature, in 19%, but only 14% had lymphocytic myocarditis. And this study from the Mass General Hospital, another autopsy study of 41 patients with fatal COVID-19, virus was noted in the heart with the histological features of myocarditis in four patients. Virus in the heart without myocarditis noted in 26 patients and no virus, no myocarditis in 11 patients. And their conclusion was that cardiac infection with SARS-CoV-2 is common among patients dying from COVID-19, but often with only rare infected cells, even though uh, uh, a cardiac infection and virus is present, but um, cellular infection with myocarditis is uncommon. And at the time of the start of the epidemic, I think we all felt that we would see a, a, a huge number of patients with myocarditis. And then this rather definitive autopsy study from Johns Hopkins, 227 autopsies from nine countries. And uh, the conclusion was that the initial review of the data indicated that myocarditis was present in 20 hearts, 7.2%. 
a closer examination of additional reported information revealed that most cases were likely not functionally significant and the true prevalence of myocarditis is likely much lower. In conclusion, across 277 cases, COVID-related histopathological findings were common, but myocarditis was rare. And these are the various autopsies. And what you see is the impression of myocarditis really came out of one, uh, only one or two autopsies shown in uh, orange here. The rest uh, demonstrated no evidence of myocarditis. So what I really want to talk about in terms of the spectrum of the cardiovascular sequelae of COVID-19 survivors is described on this slide. There are two large groups of patients. One are patients who had an acute illness, mild or asymptomatic, outpatient case, and uh, what is the incidence of long COVID in these patients? The other group are those who had an acute illness. It was severe, they were hospitalized, and they had evidence of cardiac injury. And the question is, in these people who had an acute illness, what proportion of these patients and these patients will have long haul COVID with basically nonspecific symptoms? And the other key question is in those with acute cardiac injury uh, with structural involvement acutely, uh, do they continue to have structural cardiac involvement and late cardiovascular complications, or does this resolve? And there are some reports now of some patients who had a mild acute illness, they don't just have long haul COVID, but there is some evidence of structural, late structural cardiac involvement. And we need to realize, and I need to emphasize that we're in a changing world. This is all new. And there's a great deal we have to learn. And I'm trying to summarize at least to some extent what we know at this point in time. This is a recent report from the National Center for Health Statistics. And what you see are weekly death rates in the United States by cardiovascular cause per 100,000 of the population. Yellow is 2019, orange is 2020, encompassing the, the epidemic. And what you see is a striking increase in late mortality due to ischemic heart disease. Heart failure, no different. Hypertensive diseases, another increase. Cerebrovascular and other circulatory diseases, no increase. Now that doesn't mean that in a year or two's time, we may not see an increase in heart failure, but at least these are cardiovascular deaths in the first few months of the pandemic. Conclusions, causes are multifactorial, including the avoidance of hospitals, delays in seeking and deferral of outpatient and procedural care plus the cardiovascular sequelae, perhaps, of undiagnosed COVID-19. Now, um, I want to focus on an entity called collateral damage. And this is uh, a paper from the United Kingdom that I was part of. Uh, it was published by Dr. Kite, who was a fellow of Dr. Anthony Gerschlich. Dr. Gerschlich, um, was a real pioneer uh, of interventional cardiology in the UK. I think the first to implant a stent uh, has done wonderful trial work and is a very good friend. And what he did, he set up uh, uh, this registry of 55 interventional centers in Europe, the UK and around the world to look at what happened uh, during the COVID pandemic to patients with an acute coronary syndrome. The sad and the personal part of this is the last conversation I had with Dr. Gerschlich. He was in the ICU that he set up 25 years ago. We were discussing uh, the review of this paper and how we should respond to the reviewers. And Tony died of, uh, of COVID in Leicester, England. Um, this was pre-vaccine. Pre now, what we were able to do in this study was compare the results uh, in during the COVID epidemic with two large databases pre-COVID in the UK. And these were databases of everyone in the United Kingdom that had an acute coronary syndrome. COVID in orange, pre-COVID in yellow. If you look at symptom to admission time, 
uh, it went from 179 to 339 minutes. So uh, it doubled. Partly, I think, understandably, due to a perceived perception by patients that hospitals are a dangerous place to be and they delayed presentation. If you look at the door to balloon time, it went from 37 to 83 minutes, more than doubled. And this was striking. In hospital mortality pre-COVID for all comers with acute, this is just the STEMI data, in hospital mortality 5.7%, increasing to 23%, and cardiogenic shock 87 to 20.1%. So this is what I call collateral damage. And one of the unresolved questions here is in those patients that survive, are we going to see a late epidemic of heart failure and arrhythmias? And that remains to be determined. So this was the experience during the early phases of the pandemic. And what is important, um, I think, to emphasize, this paper by Greg Stone of 10 randomized trials of patients undergoing reperfusion therapy stratified them into quartiles of infarct size. And if you look at the one-year mortality in those in the highest quartile, greater than 29.8% of the left ventricle involved, almost 9% mortality in those in the lowest quartile, less than 1% uh, mortality. And again, I want to go back to the study I've just shown you with a tripling in the um, incidence of cardiogenic shock. I think we will see amongst the survivors a significant number with very large infarcts and late complications. Another less perhaps dramatic, but equally important aspect of collateral damage is in, written in this paper by one of our fellows, Dr. Oren and myself and others. And that is the cardiometabolic toxicity of social isolation and emotional stress, and particularly amongst the elderly. And we state in the conclusion, understanding social, social isolation and its public health consequences is a key to minimizing the late cardiometabolic burden of COVID-19. But it's also fundamental to optimizing cardiovascular health outside the context of COVID-19 going into the future. And what we really meant was in, during the periods of isolation, blood pressure was not well controlled. People did not come for regular outpatient evaluations. And in many cases, hospitals were ill-equipped to undertake those outpatient um, evaluations. People exercised less, smoked more, gained weight. And these are the cardiac metabolic consequences which may translate into adverse cardiovascular health outcomes. To go back to this slide again, I've dealt with collateral damage. And really what I want to focus on now uh, is the post-acute illness manifestations, cardiovascular manifestations, namely long COVID, and what happens to the patients who have acute cardiac injury? Do they get better? Do they get worse? This is a, a quote about influenza. If, influ if influenza is a riddle wrapped in a mystery, inside an enigma, then the viral genes of the riddle, the variable surface antigens for which they code are the mystery, and the course and the cause of epidemics, the ultimate enigma. Well, isn't this surely an apt description of the clinical characteristics of the multifactorial pathophysiology and etiology of long COVID? I might add this uh, quote about uh, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma was first uh, uh, made, or the initial quote was by Sir Win Winston Churchill in the 1930s, when he was asked to explain a uh, what he felt about Russia. But I think it's a very apt quotation for what we're dealing with today. So if you look at post-acute and particularly long-haul COVID, they have cardiovascular symptoms, pain, palpitations, breathlessness, orthostatic intolerance. Some of these patients may have myocarditis. We'll come back to that. Arrhythmias, LV and RV dysfunction, leading to heart failure. But the majority, we have, basically, we see nonspecific findings on imaging and no heart failure. What are the causes? Question marks. Long-term tissue damage, 
perhaps unresolved inflammation. I think very possibly an autoimmune phenomenon and clearly autonomic dysfunction. But I might add, despite the severity and the limit and severity of the symptoms that really limit the quality of life of these individuals, the findings in most cases from a cardiovascular standpoint are relatively nonspecific. But we really need to study in these patients the autonomic nervous system in more detail. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS. I call it the electrophysiolog electrophysiologist nightmare because POTS is a very difficult disease to treat. And it again has a major limitation upon quality of life, but it's not a, an electrophysiologic disease. It's not an arrhythmic disease. It's autonomic dysfunction and a neurological disease and overlaps with chronic fatigue syndrome and post COVID-19. And we are clearly seeing increased numbers of these patients with the long haul syndrome. Now this study gained a huge amount of attention. A hundred patients came from Germany, uh, Frankfurt, Dr. Zayer's group. Hundred patients, 33% were hospitalized, mild or no symptoms in the majority, mean age 49 years, frequent comorbidities, and then they had uh, um, MRI or cardiac magnetic resonance imaging at 71 days median after the acute episode. Um, at the time of uh, CMR, 76% had an elevated high sensitivity troponin. And the findings were in 78%, there were abnormal CMR findings. Increased native T1 mapping, increased native T2 mapping, and late gadolinium enhancement, which is not really nonspecific in 32 patients. And this, literally frightened the daylights out of all of us because suddenly we now look at the spectrum and particularly the fact that a number were relatively mildly symptomatic, uh, had mild disease, and we're now looking at the specter of 78% with long-term cardiovascular manifestation. Now, there've been some other more recent studies, and I do think that that first study had its limitations in terms of uh, there was a lack of controls. Uh, but now there are more recent studies. This one from Norway, 204 patients, 20% uh, in the ICU, 12% intubated. And at three months, these are the findings. LV systolic dysfunction was uncommon. RV systolic dysfunction and LV diastolic dysfunction was present in 50%, probably associated with pulmonary pathology and RV strain and dilatation, which could also interact with the LV. Cardiac arrhythmias of uncertain clinical significance were common, PVCs and non-sustained VT. Persistent dyspnea in 50%, fatigue in two thirds, and I might add that these were not associated with echo features of cardiac dysfunction. So we have a large number of patients with persistent symptoms, dyspnea and fatigue, and a significant number of patients with nonspecific um, findings in the left ventricle and the right ventricle that are really not correlated or associated with the symptoms of shortness of breath. This has just been uh, published. It's a preprint from Oregon Health Sciences, 1355 patients and controls, uh, COVID positive uh, in 24%, and um, they were a mixture of symptomatic and asymptomatic. The primary outcome was CV morbidity and mortality. And at six months, COVID positive, the primary outcome of CV morbidity with less mortality, but significant morbidity. In those who were COVID positive, it was 12%. In those who was COVID negative, 6%. And the adjusted hazard ratio was 1.71. So for COVID positive patients, there was a 71% increase in morbidity and mortality at six months, or cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. All-cause mortality uh, after adjustment 
they showed that the time to all cause death was uh, 65 days less in COVID positive patients. Uh, and this is in people followed beyond six months. Worrying. And then this huge study published about a week ago in Nature from the VA Health System of 154,000 patients with approximately 5.5 million controls who did not get COVID and approximately 6 million historical controls from 2019. The majority were not hospitalized, and that's important, and only a minority were in the ICU. At one year, they say there's a twofold increase in incident cardiovascular events listed as cerebrovascular disease, dysrhythmias, ischemic heart disease, pericarditis, myocarditis, heart failure, and thromboembolic disease, but we don't really have any details of these specific cardiovascular morbidities. They say it was present in non-hospitalized patients, but increased in a graded fashion with increasing severity of the initial disease, which you would expect, present in all age groups and in younger patients without risk factors, such as obesity and diabetes. So uh, concern, two, three papers that really are of concern and obviously we need uh, more information. So I would summarize some of the studies to date by saying abnormal imaging findings in recovered patients are frequent, whether it be MRI or echo, or other imaging uh, uh, tools. What is their clinical significance and lack of, and, and the fact is many of them had a lack of controls. And this applies specifically to athletes who do have highly high grade, highly Competitive athletes do have abnormalities on MRIs and echoes if you look for them. What is the correlation of these findings with symptoms and the severity of the initial illness? And what is the natural history? Do they resolve? Do they persist? I've seen several reports now of late gadolinium enhancement in a non-ischemic distribution, something we see with dilated cardiomyopathy, and it's an adverse predictor and it may predict late arrhythmias, question mark, shown here. Uh, do they lead to late heart failure? I don't think so in the majority. The arrhythmias, if it's just PVCs and atrial extrasystoles, of no concern. What's the impact on full activity in regard to athletes? This was a large study from, um, of uh, professional athletes in, in the US professional sports leagues, uh, COVID positive, this is a misprint, prior acute illness, 58% of these athletes were symptomatic, almost half were asymptomatic. Uh, they had cardiovascular testing at 19 days, and it was completely normal in the vast majority, 759 out of 789. 30 athletes had one or more abnormal test results, that's 3.8% either on transthoracic echo, ECG, five had troponins, three the combination of an abnormal ECG and a transthoracic echo, and one a transthoracic echo and troponin elevation. And uh, using a standard AHA ACC guidelines, there were two out of 789 with myocarditis and two with pericarditis. Pretty reassuring by and large. And we really don't know what most of these non-specific findings on echo and ECG mean. And then Dr. Jim Udelson from Tufts wrote this very, I think, good sum summary. Return to play for athletes after COVID-19 infection. The fog begins to clear. Uh, studies on total 6,753 athletes. And this is the prevalence of myocarditis on CMR imaging. And what I want to point out, there are two outliers. The vast majority of these studies showed evidence of myocarditis in basically 0 to 4%. And uh, several with zero, a couple of 1.4, 3%. These two studies seem to be outliers. Uh, total myocarditis, 2.8%. And um, uh, of those patients, 
31.9% were asymptomatic, 2.8% on, on CMR studies, which is this graph, graph. But if you look at myocarditis in the full cohort, including those who did not have MRI, only 0.94%. I, I thought this was a very good editorial, which basically emphasized the significance of COVID-19 associated myocardial injury, our over-interpretation of scientific findings can fuel media sensationalism and spread information. When the first data came out on MRI findings, and particularly in athletes, there was a huge uh, media and um, public response, and one of great concern, which I think is to a large extent um, uh, now being allayed. And not completely, but at least reassured. This is from a, a widely read blog, setting the record straight, there is no COVID heart from John Mandrola. After a year of frightening headlines, widespread concern and countless retweets that the virus causes COVID, that causes COVID-19 may attack the heart more aggressively than any other viral illness. The verdict is in, it doesn't. Well, I don't agree with that totally. I think it does affect the heart. The question is how frequently, and I'll come back to that, but it's not to be ignored. So if you look at the late CV complications of COVID-19, I think in all likelihood, we will see serious late cardiovascular complications of COVID-19 infection. The question is, will it be frequent, uncommon, or rare? And that remains a question mark. I intuitively feel it will be uncommon or rare, but it's a question mark. And so to summarize, what do we know? Cardiac injury during the acute phase of COVID-19 is common and an adverse prognostic factor. The etiology is multifactorial. In COVID survivors, cardiac abnormalities and imaging are frequent, irrespective of the severity of the acute illness. What don't we know? We really don't know the natural history and clinical significance of the abnormal findings in acute survivors. We do not know the late natural history of survivors of acute coronary syndromes who had delayed therapy as shown in that uh, UK study. And I might add that study of Dr. Gershlich's has also been repeated by Dr. Tim Henry in this country. The mechanisms and etiology of the different manifestations of virus presence in the heart are really unknown. And the approach to competitive athletes and whether prior guidelines on myocarditis are applicable to the COVID population, I think they are. I think we do have guidelines about the return to play for athletes after flu and other viral illnesses. And I think those guidelines are probably going to be applicable to the COVID-19 uh, athletes with COVID-19 infections. Mark Twain made this uh, tremendous prescient quote, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And I think what we can conclude with is this, uh, profound thoughts. What we do know for sure is that there is a great deal more that we do not know. And so my final slide makes the plea for more data. We need perspective, large, specifically phenotype longitudinal follow-up studies, including athletes and different, and different ethnic groups. This is a really important entity to emphasize. And the question mark, the questions, symptoms, functional limitation, morbidity and survival. And these are the imaging endpoints that have to be collected. CMR, event monitoring and stress testing. The duration of follow-up needs to be not just months, but years. And I'm pleased to um, note and, um, uh, that these kinds of very large studies are now ongoing. NHLBI is a very large study in this country, but there's several uh, ongoing uh, studies such as this in uh, different parts of the world, and we will get the answers in the not too distant future. But I think it's really important that these studies are not just short term. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Gersh. It was a very illuminating and fascinating talk, as, as always. Um, I think for the audience, I think it's very important to differentiate the risk from the burden of disease. So risk being, like for example, you said myocarditis, the hazard ratio for myocarditis in this recent VA paper uh, has been five as compared to arrhythmias or for example, ischemic heart disease, where the hazard ratio is about 1.7, 1.8. But the burden of disease is very low for myocarditis long term, whereas the burden of disease for more common problems like arrhythmias and ischemic heart disease is, is much more uh, than, than less common uh, problems like myocarditis. We did report last month on a 32% reduction in uh, patients presenting with ACS, but then there was a relationship of the decline in their presentation with the lockdowns uh, that happened statewide. Um, there are several questions from uh, the audience, and I'll go over one by one. Uh, the first question is by Dr. Strauss, uh, and she says, uh, now in the MGH study, you said there is no virus, there is no myocarditis, and then how are they attributing the deaths to cardiovascular complications? Effectively, the MGH study was 41 patients. Four of them had clear viral myocarditis. A significant majority had evidence of virus in the heart, but without myocarditis. And that means that there was virus in the heart without the histological appearance of viral myocarditis. And then there were about, I think, 11 patients yeah. that had no virus and no myocarditis. So I think it, it, is, um, it, it is certainly possible to die from an acute viral infection of the heart or even from a late viral or the late complications without having myocarditis. And it may be that and it may be, now I emphasize the maybe because these are the unknowns. Um, it may be that virus in the heart causes um, microvascular dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, or um, endothelial dysfunction leading to thrombosis, both in a macrovascular and a microvascular level. So yes, you are dying of, um, you're dying of, um, thank you very much. And let me just, I'll go to that slide. Yes, you are dying of a COVID infection of the heart, but it may be that um, it's not myocarditis at all. It is, and this is the study you're talking about here. Yeah, that one, the 11. Viral patients. in the heart, four yeah. patients. Viral in the heart without myocarditis, 26 patients. Four patients with myocarditis and 11 patients without. And I actually think if I go back to this very complex first slide, I do think that, um, let me uh, just bring it up here. I think this is not just I think, I mean, many people think this is a very important entity, thrombosis arterial and venous, and it may be viral mediated platelet inflammation, inflammation. And then I think this is really important as well, endothelial and microvascular inflammation and dis dysfunction. And that may be in the long term, uh, an important, a really important cause of long term morbidity. And we have seen reports of patients, um, and I've heard of this on a personal level, of patients who were perfectly healthy before COVID, who developed classic microvascular angina, who at cath have um, acetylcholine vasoconstriction, which is how we define vasospasm. So I, I think that um, you know, myocarditis is the usual suspect, the obvious sub suspect, but it's relatively infrequent. So uh, just getting this forward, uh, Dr. Bohl asked, uh, how does this COVID-19 cardiovascular complications compare to other COVID variants and also more recent Omicron? Have we learned from or are there studies published on different variants of even COVID-19? How does uh, that affect the cardiovascular, uh, or, or we don't have I, that data? I, 
I, I, I don't really know the answer. I, I mean, I think I know about as much as you do about the virology, but, um, and, and, and obviously none of us are virologists. I mean, what I do know is the prevailing viewpoint is that Omicron is a much more benign variant. It's much more infectious, but it's more benign. Uh, having said that, in older patients with comorbidities, it, it may still be, uh, it, it may still be uh, lead to a very severe illness. What I don't know is any study that has looked at cardiac injury as defined by troponins and drawn the conclusion that uh, it is less, there's less cardiac involvement uh, with one variant versus another. What we do know, I think generally now, is that Omicron is associated with less hospitalization a lower duration of hospital stay. It is a more benign condition or benign variant. It doesn't mean that some people won't have severe injury, but I don't know of any, I mean, severe disease. I do not know of any direct comparison of uh, at least published of cardiac injury in Delta versus Omicron. My own impression would be that it's more severe and more frequent with Delta. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Kumari asks, uh, is there a difference between when you get viral myocarditis versus those infrequent cases of vaccine-related myocarditis? Yeah, I think there is. It's a very good question. I think vaccine-related myocarditis is, is, is really um, probably an autoimmune-related inflammatory condition of the heart, no question. It's not you. It's been seen, um, it, it was described with chickenpox vaccine years ago. So it's not new. It tends to affect young males and teenagers, and it's very self-limiting, uh, at least I think in all the cases I've seen published. I think that myocarditis, when it occurs with COVID, is a, a marker of more severe inflammation plus perhaps inflammation uh, and maybe other cardiovascular manifestations. What we do know is from the center, for, I think it's from um, the center for National Center for Health Statistics, um, that the likelihood of myocarditis with a vaccine, which does occur in young people, tends to be males, tends to be teenagers, it is still less than the incidence of myocarditis acutely in COVID-19. So even with a vaccine, it's still less frequent than in patients that get severe COVID-19 infection. So, so I, think that the, I think that the documentation of um, uh, myocarditis and pericarditis with a vaccine should not be used as an excuse not to have the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Dr. Marx asked about POX, and he mentions that uh, shall we do cardiac MR uh, in those patients? And then also, what is the role of inflammatory markers uh, for a routine surveillance in these patients? I, 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 I absolutely don't know. It's a very good question. And this is being looked at right now in these long-term prospective studies that uh, are collecting evidence for acute cardiac injury acutely, namely troponin elevations, and seeing what happens to them over time and how they correlate with persistent symptoms. Because it is possible that some people with persistent symptoms may have ongoing inflammation. Or I think, I think it's probably autoimmunity. So we don't know at this stage what the role is of the cardiac biomarkers late. Personally, I would get a measurement of uh, troponin and perhaps CRP in these patients. Would I do MRI in people with POTS routinely? No. I think I'd, if, if, if they had um, uh, an abnormal electrocardiogram, and particularly if the echo was abnormal, then I think it's reasonable to get an MRI. I wouldn't do it routinely. I think that I've seen POTS working as an electrophysiologist. I've seen POTS 
frequently um, after undisclosed viral illnesses, whether they be flu, coxsackie, who knows. But typically, uh, women in their 30s, educated, many of them active athletes, you know, quite serious athletes. And it's a debilitating condition. And the reason I say the electrophysiologist nightmare, there's not much we can do for them. They have these postural tachycardias, ablating these patients would be a disaster. And what they need is really, you know, POTS was first described at the Mayo Clinic in detail by Dr. Philip Lowe, a, a neurologist. And it's a disease of the autonomic nervous system. And uh, neurologists take care of them, but one critical aspect of POTS is uh, a very uh, a comprehensive multidisciplinary a rehab program with graded exercise, sometimes uh, aerobic exercise in water, in a pool, but it, it needs a comprehensive multidisciplinary um, group to treat POTS. So do you think and the one predilection of this virus for the autonomic nervous system, uh, that's why- I think I've seen it after other viral infections. And what I think really is important when these patients come and they're pretty debilitated, a significant number are told, look, you don't have an infection anymore. It's all in your head. It is not. It's, yeah. it's real. And it how about, overlaps, uh, as I Dr. said. Gersh, how about changing the topic a little bit? Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Boats asked about hypercoagulability. Um, what is the difference or what are the differences you think uh, are if you want to compare acute COVID infection versus a long-term or a chronic COVID infection? I don't think we know that. So it has implications that, on the anticoagulation and such because the PE and, and arterial thrombosis is, is much more common after COVID-19. No, absolutely no question. And uh, you know, there's a lot written and there are good, good consensus guidelines on who should be discharged on oral anticoagulants in a substantial number of people. And obviously, if they've had a DVT or a PA, a PE during hospitalization, I think the discussion is how long do you anticoagulate them for? Is it three months or six months or whatever? But I don't know of any studies on coagulation factors in patients presenting at three to six months with, with you know, non-specific symptoms. I just don't think we have that data. Yeah. So there is one attendee who asked, now you mentioned this collateral damage issue, right? So the symptom onset to um, presentation time, door to balloon times, they're all prolonged. And he mentions that, is it because of lack of healthcare workers being present uh, or while they're waiting for the COVID test? So that's one part of the question. And the second part is that knowing that underserved minority patients had higher rates of COVID infection and traditionally have poor CVD clinical outcomes, how can we effectively determine future incidence of CVD within that population and possibly aggressively address the risk factors at the same time? Well, I think that's a very good, um, it's not even a question, it's a statement and it's a very important statement. I think that the uh, collateral damage that we've seen, it's not universal. I know um, I presented some of these data in Europe and in some centers in Europe, they didn't see that. They really didn't. So it may be region specific. It may be in part due to um, the logistics and the logistical constraints and the availability of resources in that particular region. It may also be patient specific. Some patients may be more reluctant to go to hospital uh, than others. And it may depend upon the quality of the hospital in the, in the area. So there are multiple, multiple factors. Um, the second part of your statement, I, I echo that. Um, uh, COVID has brought out disparity, so brought, has magnified the disparities already present in our society in the delivery of cardiovascular care. And they've been magnified by COVID. And of course, um, you know, these uh, minorities are at a greater risk in terms of cardiovascular risk factors. 
with or without COVID. And so I think that um, the impact of isolation on cardiovascular risk factor management and its late implications is profound. It's going to be very difficult to study, but it, it, it is really an issue. And that may be one of the things that is responsible in the one slide I showed for the late incidence of hypertensive deaths during the first year of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, if, if we have to focus on groups, you, you mentioned athletes is one, right? Which where uh, even though the overall myocarditis incidence is less than 1%, but can have profound implication for that high intensity um, exercise group uh, and can be fatal even though they may not have symptoms. Um, and then you brought out the, uh, the race and ethnicity issue. Uh, do you think the other uh, susceptible, susceptible group that we may need to have special focus on will be uh, older individuals where there are tons of comorbid conditions that make them more susceptible to a long-term COVID infection sequelae? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think that in terms of competitive athletes, there are good guidelines in in focus i mean in in print that are not just COVID related related to any athlete with a viral myocarditis and they're good and i think they ensure safety uh there's a role for stress testing there's a role for imaging there may be a role for halter monitoring and some what i think we haven't yet seen and th th there are a number of sports medicine individuals who are looking at this and that is if you're um, a top class professional athlete and you lose 5% of your performance, that could have a huge effect on their livelihoods and their success as an athlete. Hopefully that's not going to be an issue and not a long-term issue, but it's something to think about. Uh, you talk about older, older individuals with comorbidities who have higher morbidity from acute COVID. And I think it's reasonable to suppose, I suppose, hypothesize that they may be at a greater risk of long COVID, but we don't know that. Mm -hmm. That's what the studies, again, are looking at. Um, and and um, Dr. Uh, we don't know that. Kumari has asked again about, do you have any uh, imaging or any uh, markers? For example, you said post-vaccination myocarditis is mainly autoimmune. Uh, any inflammatory or, or any other markers that will help um, the audience differentiate? Because you have patients who received a booster or a vaccine and then got into uh, presentation with, with myocarditis. Now they are unsure whether this is a COVID infection or this is a myo uh, vaccine related myocarditis. So are there any tests? Well, there's, there, no, there's no way you're really going to know. I mean, it, it's it's a clinical scenario. Someone in really good health, 17 year, year old, excellent health, they get a vaccination and four days later they've got chest pain with myocarditis and, and more frequently pericarditis. That, that, that's all I need to know. And the likelihood that they will resolve is um, a very, very high. Yeah. I, 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 I think probably almost universally it will resolve within a few days. And that actually we did see with uh, varicella, chickenpox vaccination years ago. In fact, in up to date, we've got a, a paragraph in up to date uh, on varicella myocarditis. And I actually raised the question of whether it was redundant and just of historical value and we should take it out of up to date. But not, of course, it's not because of the COVID vaccine. Now, what is difficult. I have seen some slides of an MRI with quite extensive late gadolinium enhancement in a young individual. That individual had COVID and subsequently was vaccinated without an acute vaccination um, syndrome. Now, uh, there it gets difficult. I don't know whether what we're seeing related to 
scarring from the original infection or whether it was related to the vaccine. But I don't think the vaccine, my understanding is it's very short-lived, severe and painful for two, three days, as pericarditis always is, and then it goes away. So I have a few minutes left, and uh, it's quite unusual, but I think something that I wish to ask you for a long time, um, as my uh, mentor, as my teacher, and I think it will help uh, people who are uh, viewing and, and listening to your talk, is how they can become Bernie Gersh, you know? So just let us know uh, in a few minutes. I know it, you, you've had a, a, a career of, uh, in cardiology. I just want to know, and, and if you can let all the audience know, where did you start and how did you become uh, Bernie Gersh? And how can they become Tajik and Nishimura and Bernie Gersh if they wish to? What do they need to do? <laughs> Maybe most of them are too sane to want to become, to go through all of that. I think my children would have a different answer to that question. Well, I think, you know, I think the key is you have to love what you do. You have to be fascinated by, by what one does. And aside from being a clinical cardiologist who spent most of my time in the CCU, I just found a lot of... Uh, very interesting questions to ask that come up in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. And then when you work in an institution like ours, uh, one has the resources to sit down and say, um, well, we, you know, we don't really know. Let's look at it. And one of my mentors, Bob Fry, always said to me, don't just quote everybody else's data. What about our data? What, what do our data show us? So I think you have to have the curiosity and the interest, and there's no shortage of interesting questions. And I had a meeting last week with some of my colleagues in the artificial intelligence group, and we've just come up with three or four really interesting questions that need to be answered, and we will answer them. And then I suppose the other aspect of it is we're all very busy, and, and no one's going to do it between nine and five. You have to, um, you have to work longer hours. And for that, I'm very grateful in that I've had an incredibly supportive wife and family. Incredibly supportive. They've supported me in my career for 30, 40 years. I don't, I don't, know, I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, it, it just happens or it doesn't, but you have to work. And ask the questions because um, I frequently get asked, some really good questions from non-academic cardiologists who say, look, I've got a patient with A, B, and C. What do you think? And you say, you know, I'm not sure I've seen that before. Maybe we should try and study that. You have to love what you do because it is time consuming. Yeah, yeah. So, so three things, uh, love what you do, right? Curiosity and a loving wife. Not, no, in, and, and, not and, in that order. No, and, not and, in that order. And no, and loving wife and children Absolutely. who are supportive. Absolutely. Because they're the ones that, um, you know, when we're working nights and weekends, sometimes uh, we, 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 you know, take the time away from them. And then obviously you've got to have a, a certain amount of intellect. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been it's been a pleasure uh, and an honor. Uh, again, uh, till we meet uh, with, with another fascinating talk uh, by you. Uh, till then, be well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Mandy. Bye-bye now.